Hello and welcome to PowerShell Summit 2021. Uh, this is my session. Hey, you put Pester in my Terraform, testing infrastructure as code. So let's get into it. So a little about me. My name is Brandon Olin. I am a uh, staff site reliability engineer at Stack Overflow. I'm also a Microsoft MVP in cloud and data center management. And you can find me on the internet as Dev Black Ops on Twitter, on GitHub, you can find my blog at devblackops.io if you want to get in contact with me there. I'm also currently in the process of writing a book on LeanPub called Building PowerShell Modules. As it kind of the name implies, it's all about building PowerShell modules, really high quality ones, including module design, testing, CICD, just kind of general concepts of modules and best practices. If you're into that kind of thing, I encourage you to check out the book. If you want to check out the presentation or any of the example code after the fact, you can find it on GitHub at this link right here. So let's get into the agenda uh, a little bit. So first we need to kind of define what is infrastructure as code. And I'm going to spend a little bit kind of explaining that in detail so everyone has a good common frame of reference. Next, we need to kind of talk about why we would test infrastructure as code. And once we do that, we can kind of get into what are the different types of tests, including unit and integration tests. And after that, a little bit about Terraform 101, just to kind of get everyone level set on what Terraform is, what it looks like. Once we've done that, we can dive into exactly how we can test Terraform with Pester. So what is infrastructure as code? Um, at a high level, it defines what your infrastructure should look like and then some type of process, either on your machine or in the cloud or somewhere else, executes that template um, or that instruction and actually builds infrastructure. So in, in an Azure sense, that would be an ARM template or Terraform, as I'll show you in, in this example. It's also, you know, you can kind of think of infrastructure as code as reusable templates or modules, so you can build similar, similar infrastructure over and over again. It allows for creating really highly complex infrastructure quickly and consistently. Once you've defined it once in code, you can just run that code over and over again and get the same result to kind of really boost your ability to kind of build infrastructure at scale. And really we should think of infrastructure as code as normal code. And with that, it, it should be tested. It should be put in source control. You should have all of the, the, the standard coding and the development practices that you would do for C Sharp or Node or you know Rust and Go and, and things like that, all of those should really apply to your infrastructure code as well. So another example to kind of illustrate why we should test infrastructure as code is take a look at these, these two examples. On the left, we have an, a Terraform example where we're going to build an Azure storage account. On the right, we have a little bit of Node.js that's creating a simple web server. Both of these are code and both of these are executing some useful work. We should really think of our infrastructure code no different than Node and C Sharp and Go, etc. We need to test it, we need to put it in source control, and we should follow all of the, the standard development practices in doing so. Remember, it is just code. It may not be in C Sharp, it you know, or a traditional programming language, it may be in YAML or in JSON or in HCL in the case of Terraform. But we have to test it. It is code. Second, nobody is perfect. Like I said, it is code. So infrastructure as code has bugs, just as normal code will have bugs. Our testing hopefully is meant to catch those and allow us to fix them before they could become an issue. Thirdly, kind of your infrastructure will change over time, just like code evolves and changes over time. New requirements are introduced, uh, new constraints, etc. That code has to be updated and tested to make sure it kind of meets the business requirements. Your infrastructure is no different. Things will change. You got to build more servers. You got to change the size of things. You got to edit networking settings, add firewall rules, etc. All of those involve an evolving infrastructure and you need the test that to make sure that it meets your standards. So the tests are how we make sure that our infrastructure is configured the way we think it is. And the tests are also meant to ensure that it stays working as things inevitably change. So let's talk a little bit about some of the high level categories of tests. 
you know, at the top left here, we have unit tests. And these are very meant to be very basic, small and fast tests that test a component of your application, or in, in this case, your infrastructure in isolation. You know, your expected inputs, yield, and expected output. So two plus two equals four. Unit tests should not really modify the environment. They're meant to be, again, they're meant to be run in isolation. And because of that, they have limited to no dependencies on external things. So in the case of infrastructure, if you're running a unit test, I can't expect all of this external infrastructure to exist to run my tests. Again, I want them to be fast and cheap. So I can't be building up all this infrastructure to run a simple unit test. They should be fast. Integration tests, on the other hand, tend to be a little bit more involved. They test how different components interact with each other. So if I build up a storage account and a net, some type of network, I need to glue those two pieces together in the case of maybe Azure with a storage account and private link. So I may have two different components, one building network, one building storage. I will build those up and test how they, in, how they interact with each other and make sure that they that whatever process I, I'm interested in solving works end to end. Integration tests also can have dependencies. Again, so if I'm building a storage account with let's say Azure Private Link, it has a, you know, by definition, it has a dependency on some type of networking being deployed. So if I'm testing storage, my dependency is some type of network. So integration tests involve dealing with those dependencies, maybe provisioning them or wiring them up, et cetera. Because of all this extra work that integration tests are doing, they tend to be slower than unit tests. That could be, you know, in terms of time, they could also be just larger in terms of cost. And because they're generally slower and maybe cost more to execute in either compute time or actually dollars, you generally have less unit tests, or sorry, less integration tests than you would have unit tests. Another type of test is uh, linting, and it's not shown in the testing pyramid at the top right where you have unit tests as your, your foundation and, and integration tests is a layer above. Linting tests are like the bedrock below that. So linting is a, is a process to validate that your code is actually technically correct. And, and kind of what I mean by that is actually it's free of like syntax errors, like it could compile is would be a form of linting. Another form would be it conforms to whatever style guidelines, the language you have that you're the language that you're working in. Linting basically at the end of the day kind of answers, will my code run? Another form of test some people maybe frown upon it, but I think it's actually a very critical thing is, is manual testing. It is the most common testing that people will do, whether they kind of are cognizant of it or not. If you're writing some code and checking the inputs and outputs, you're doing some type of form of manual testing. Manual tests can be tedious and inconsistent though. So we have to be careful about how we use them, but Manual tests that are documented can form the basis of automated tests in the future. So manual tests, I think, are, are, are great, but you know you have to keep them in check and make sure that you don't just do manual tests. You really need to you know, convert those manual tests uh, into in unit tests or integration tests uh, as soon as possible and really kind of codify them so you can execute them with some consistency. But manual tests are better than nothing. If that's what you have, that's a great foundation. You know, you really want to kind of move those into unit and integration tests when you can. So Terraform 101. Terraform, for folks who don't know, is a declarative tool uh, written by HashiCorp. It's in a specific language called HCL or HashiCorp configuration language. Terraform reads that configuration document and it can plan and build infrastructure from that. So in the case of Azure, I could, I could write some code in HCL to say, hey, create me a storage account and a resource group and a network and a VM. I could pass those in the Terraform. I can run a plan. So it would, Terraform would figure out what it needs to do based on what the code I'm writing is saying. 
and what is reality in, in the, or in Azure. And then I can apply that infrastructure and actually have it build everything that I told it to. Terraform supports all the major cloud providers, on-premise infrastructure like VMware, and it has a really healthy e ecosystem of open source providers to build all kinds of infrastructure. So we're talking, you know, the, the big kind of clouds like Azure and AWS and Google. We're also talking VMware and Kubernetes and, you know, third-party SaaS products have modules or providers, I should say, in Terraform as well. So here's the basic kind of uh, three-step process that we go through with Terraform. So first off on the left here, we have to actually write the Terraform. In this case, I am defining something in Azure. So I'm using the Azure provider from Terraform using a specific version, in this case, 2.53.0. And then I'm telling Terraform, hey, go create me a, a resource group called PS Summit 2021 in the East US Azure region and give me some tags. So that's a really basic Terraform configuration. The next step is the plan step. And in the middle here, you can see that I'm running Terraform plan to consume the, the document I just wrote that would define what the resource group should look like. And Terraform plan will consume that and query Azure to see if it has an existing resource group called that with those settings. And if it doesn't, it's going to have, it's going to say, I need to go create this resource. If it did exist and, but it was slightly different and need to maybe change some tags or something like that, it would say, Hey, this resource exists, but I need to modify some properties of it. And the third step is actually running that plan and, and executing it and actually changing infrastructure in some way. So in this example, I'm running Terraform apply to actually create that resource group. Another kind of critical piece of Terraform to understand, which we're going to get into with the tests. This is kind of a, um, a kind of an integral piece to understanding how to test Terraform with Pester is the, the Terraform state file. At a high level, the Terraform state file is a JSON file that Terraform uses to keep track of everything that it's done with the infrastructure. So if you told Terraform to go create a, a resource group, a representation of that resource group and its settings will be in the state file. Terraform uses that to compare reality, meaning what's in Azure, with what you've told it to do in your, in your, your Terraform code, reconciles that and decides what to do. So it's, it's a critical piece to how Terraform works. And we need to understand it just a little bit so we can figure out how we can effectively test Terraform because we're going to have to inspect that state file. And I'll show you that in the demos. And speaking of demos, let's go into the first demo. So our first demo is just showing you a little bit about basic Terraform before I kind of get into how we're actually going to test this, we actually need to know kind of the bits and pieces of it. So at the high level, we're going to define a, um, a provider, what's called the Terraform provider. And this is just the, the actual Terraform plugins, if you will, that will execute infrastructure and, on various cloud providers. So in this case, we're using the, the Azure provider with a certain version. This could also be, you know, AWS and Google and Kubernetes, they all have different providers. The next thing we're going to do is um, define a provider block. You would use this to actually put some credential information into the provider. In this case, I'm not using it because I'm using the, the native, um, the, the, lo the local Azure CLI authentication. The next thing we're actually going to do is define a resource group. So in this example, we're going to create a resource group called PS Summit 2021 in the West US Azure region, and we're going to give it a tag called development. So the first thing we need to do is run Terraform init. And before I do that, let me make sure I'm actually in the right directory. So we're going to run Terraform init. And this will, um, as the name implies, initialize Terraform. And it's actually going to download the plugins that you've, that you've defined in Terraform. In this case, the Azure RM one. You can see it, it's created this .terraform directory right here. The next thing we're going to do is run Terraform validate to just make sure that there's no typos or syntac syntactical errors in our code. Um, this is a, um, an example of some type of form of linting test that you can wire up to your, your, your tests later. So that passed. 
Now we're going to run Terraform plan, and this will actually read our file and go figure out, do I need to go create a resource group? Um, is there an existing one that needs to change, etc. And here Terraform has come back and said, I need to go create this resource group. That's what this plus symbol equals. So that's good. Before I actually run the Terraform apply though, I'm going to back up and show you another thing you can do with the plan because this is critical to how we're actually going to consume this information in Pester. So I'm going to run Terraform a plan again, but I'm going to output it to a file. And we're going to use this file later in just a second to and import it and into PowerShell to figure out what the plan is actually going to do. And we're going to use this for our unit tests. So now that I've created a file here called Terraform plan, I'm going to Oops. Convert it to JSON and then to a PowerShell. Convert from JSON. Convert it from JSON into an object. And here we can start figuring out what the plan was actually going to do in a machine readable form. We can see that we have this resource changes property, which lists the actual name of the resource, the type that it was, and the changes, we can dig into the changes. You can see that it's going to, has an action that's create, and the um, after the a plan, or after, sorry, after the apply would have run, this is what the changes should be. So we can use these as inputs into unit tests, so we can run a plan, pass those values into Pester, and actually run some pester tests to say, you know, should the, the resource group be this called this? Should it be in this browser region? Should it have these number of tags? Should the name conform to this naming format? All of those are good unit tests that we can start building. We actually haven't built any infrastructure. Now we're going to run Terraform apply against that plan file that we just created so we can build the infrastructure. And I'll show you a, an example of the state file, which is another critical piece that we're going to use in Pester. Okay, so that created, great. Let's just do a double check. And use PowerShell to make sure that that resource group exists and it does, awesome. Now that we actually built some infrastructure, we can actually look at the state file that Terraform created because this is, again, this is going to be a critical piece that we need to understand so we can effectively build some tests. Is, so let's look at the state file. We can run Terraform show, convert it to JSON. We're going to look at the state file that it created locally here and convert that from JSON. And this is the record of, this is the kind of the brains of Terraform. This is everything Terraform knows about your infrastructure. And we can kind of dig into this. Whoops. So it knows about, in this case, one resource with a name, what provider is. Let's dig into the values. Let's look at the first resource, because it's an array. Look at the value, you can see that it came back with a Azure ID for um, the resource group. Uh, we have our name and our, our tags, etc. So that's all great. So now that we have that, let's go ahead and destroy it. And I'll show you the, uh, another example in just a second. So we'll go ahead and destroy this. And we'll go back to the presentation. So that was an example of a really basic Terraform configuration where I'm just creating one resource. The real power of Terraform is, is reusability and kind of composing multiple resources on the top of each other, starting to group them together in similar components so we can kind of start reusing things and building 
more and more complex infrastructure. Terraform modules are the, are the way to do that. Um, they're used to kind of abstract away implementation details of really complex configurations and kind of hide it behind a, a really simple facade of, hey, just go, you know, in, in, in this case, you know, on the right, I can have a module called servers that would build some Azure VMs and it would, you know, do some load balancing and it could do some networking shenanigans and things like that. But I can hide that all of that implementation in the module and I can just say, hey, give me the number of servers you want me to create and in what region and I'll go build all this infrastructure for you. This is the primary way that you package and kind of reuse Terraform configurations. This is what we're actually going to be testing with, with Pester. The high level uh, module components have some input value, uh, input variables, the actual resources, which I just showed you. And then you can have some optional output variables. So you can kind of pass back what you just created. You can pass back some properties. So let's look at a uh, example of a basic module. So here I have a module, which is just a directory that has a little bit more advanced, um, a little bit more involved Terraform configuration. In this example, I am creating a storage account with a bunch of settings. You can see that I am, you know, enforcing HTTPS only traffic. I am disallowing public blobs from ever being created. Here is the syntax for actually using input variables. So you can see that this module is creating a storage account, but it's going to be in a resource group that you you have provided it as a variable. Next thing we're going to create is a, a storage container. So we can actually, you know, put some stuff into that storage account. And just for good measure, we're going to enable advanced threat protection on this. We're also going to output a couple settings after we create the the storage account. So we're going to output the, the storage account ID, its name and its location. And here is the input variables that I just mentioned. So these are the either required or optional variables that you need to pass into a module so it can do its work. So in this case, I'm giving it, I'm asking for a prefix so I can name resources a certain way. I'm asking for the resource group, location, tags, etc. Whatever settings you need for that module, you can make available in as variables. So that's the module, and I'm going to consume that module. Just like a demo one, we have our Terraform, our, our Terraform block that defines what provider we're using, some provider specific settings if we have any. In this example, I'm going to define some local variables so I can kind of organize my code a little bit better. And I'm going to create a resource group. Notice that this resource group was not created in, in the, 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 storage, the storage account module. This is a dependency that that module has. So I need to create a resource group and then pass that, that resource group name into modules so multiple modules can build things into a common resource group. This is, this is an example of a dependency that a module may have. Here is the actual call to run that module where I'm going to give it a uh, very gobbledygook prefix to, to name the resource. I'm going to give it the location, which was in that local variable. I'm going to pass in the storage account, or sorry, the, the resource group name into that module and some, as well as the replication type and, and tags, etc. And then I want to output some values from this configuration. So I'm going to pull out the storage account ID and the storage account name that the module created. So let's go ahead and see what this looks like. So again, just like any other demo, we have to run Terraform init to download any providers. For good measure, we're going to run Terraform validate to make sure we don't have any syntax errors or anything like that. 
And then we can run our plan. And I'm also going to output this to a plan file. There you go. This guy is going to create a bunch of stuff. So four resources to create. That's great. Our storage count. Our resource group. Um, advanced threat protection. And our container is in there somewhere. So now let's go ahead and create that. So run Terraform Apply. We're on auto approve so it doesn't prompt us. And then we're going to pass in the plan file that we just created. Okay, it looks like our four resources just got created. That's great. We can do a little bit of double checking. So we can do get az storage account. Give it the name of this thing that it just created. And submit 2021. Just to make sure that this is there and it is, that's great. We can also, just as another way to, to look at the state file, we can run Terraform state list. And this will list all of the resources that Terraform knows about in the state file. And we can even dig a little bit into these. So we can look at the, uh, sorry, let's look at the resource group. So we can look at the state file this way and show all the settings. This is the same data that was in the state file that we imported in with JSON. So that created just what we wanted. So let's go ahead and destroy this. And then I'll dig into how we can actually use the this state file and this plan file in Pester itself. So let's go ahead and destroy that and learn how we can actually apply these things in Pester. Okay, so to test Terraform effectively, we need to do a few things. We need to, well, what we should do is we should test in an isolated environment. You don't want to be running these tests in a, in a production environment with your, alongside your production infrastructure. It's really a good idea to, to run these in a separate, you know, in the case of Azure, in a separate subscription that you would have no quarrels about, you know, completely destroying if you wanted to a, a clean slate. The next thing is we want to be able to create and destroy infrastructure all the time. So this is, you know, stuff that gets created for a test may only live for a second or, you know, a couple seconds or a few minutes and then gets destroyed. We want ephemeral infrastructure to run our tests. And because this is, this is an isolated environment with resources coming and going, we need to be able to, you know, build up dependencies for what our modules need. So. In the case of what I just showed you a little bit ago, you know, we had a storage account module that needed a resource group. That resource group was a dependency. So we need to be able to, you know, in order to effectively test a storage account module, we need to build up a resource group and be able to pass it in as a dependency to that module, run our tests, and then destroy it all. Another good thing that we should be thinking about is creating a set of example configurations for modules because these example configurations can actually be used as test cases in our, in our pester tests. So we can run different scenarios on our module. We can kind of codify those in, into examples. And then when we, when we wire up our tests, we can loop through all of those examples and test them individually. And I just showed you that the plan file and the state file how to use those kind of interactively with the, in the console. Now let's actually apply some of that information in our Pester tests. So to test Terraform with Pester specifically, again, those test cases that I just talked about are going to become Pester test cases. Unit tests and integration tests, which I talked about earlier, can become contexts, different Pester contexts in our test. So we can have a, a, cont a pester context for unit tests with a tag called unit. And then that can run our Terraform plan 
and import our plan file, look at our intended changes. We can run some pester, make sure that those changes are what we think they should be. Um, we can have another context for integration where we, again, run that plan file to generate the plan document. We can also then run Terraform Apply to actually deploy that infrastructure into our test environment, import our plan file and our state file. You know, we can then we can go get the actual deployed resources in Azure, maybe using Azure PowerShell or Azure CLI. And then we can actually use all that information and actually create pester tests to validate what we what we want our module to do. So let's get into the demo of Pester. Okay, so let's look at the next demo. We're actually gonna take all this into practice. So here I again have a an Azure storage account. This is my module kind of refactored a bit, including some tests. So here I have my storage account. We have our container and our advanced threat protection. We have our outputs that we've defined. We also have some variables. Go away, VS Code thingy. We have our, our variables that we're going to input. And we have our examples that I mentioned earlier. So these examples are going to form the test cases that we'll put in. So here, I'm going to create some infrastructure, some dependencies, and then call our module. So here I am defining a random integer um, that we'll use as our ID for naming resources. I'll create a resource group using that random name. And then I'm gonna call the module, which is just a couple of uh, folders above. I've also defined some variables that we'll import into, into Pestro so we can actually test this test, you know, use these as uh, inputs to our test case. And here is another example where we have slightly different values. In this case, we're going to create a, a premium storage account. In the, in the other one, we're going to create a standard. Um, actually, this one actually should be 30 days of retention. And here is our pester file. The way we're going to do this in pester is we're going to use the before discovery block and we're going to enumerate our test cases. In this case, we're just going to get a list of the example directories. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to pass those test cases into a describe block named Terraform module storage. And then this will be the name of the, the, um, the example directory. And next we have to do, before we actually run our tests, we need to do a before all block where we're going to change the directory into that test case and run our Terraform init and our validate and create our plan file. And then we're going to grab that plan file as well as our variables that we've defined. We're gonna use these in our, test in our, uh, in our tests. After everything is done, we're gonna exit the directory. So in this case, we have a unit context with the tag of unit. So we can run our unit and integration tests separately because there are different tags. What we need to do is define some addresses in our plan. So we know that if we look at our plan object, we have a property called resource changes. Inside that, there are a bunch of objects and there's an address property for each one. So we know what our storage account will be called or what, how it's addressed in Terraform. We know what our container and our, and our advanced threat protection resource. We're going to get references to those objects in the plan. The next thing we're going to do is take those plan objects and do some pester assertions to, you know, actually test, hey, does this plan actually create a resource? Is the plan going to create the resource in the location that we've specified in our variables? Is it going to be in the, the account tier that we've specified in our variables and the re replication type? And, you know, is it going to only allow HTTPS and not HTTP? So this enable HTTPS traffic only should be true. You know, we want to prevent anyone to be able to create a public container in the storage account. So we've disabled that in our module. We want to make sure that that will be false in the plan. 
We do this because as the module evolves and people change it, maybe yourself, you know, future you or a coworker, there's a chance that, you know, someone could change the logic in the module. And, you know, we want to make sure that the module behaves in the way we expect it. So we've codified how that module should behave in these tests. And as it changes, you know, if someone went into the module and turned this to false or enable public blob access to true accidentally, we would catch that in our, in our unit tests because, you know, we've explicitly said that these things should be false. So this will catch, you know, errors or bugs as the module gets updated over time. The next thing we have is our another context block with a tag of integration. And this is where we're actually going to create that infrastructure in our test subscription and run some additional kind of more involved tests. So we don't need to, you know, reuse the same test and validate that the storage account name is named this way or it's in this location. We've already tested those things in the unit test. What we want to do here is you know, test how this module behaves. So in order to do that, we actually need to get, like I showed earlier, we need to get the current pester state that just got created after we ran our Terraform apply step. We also need to grab a couple values out of that state file so then we can know what, how to address, um, we know how to get the resources from Azure because, you know, we're creating a a random ID that we're going to use to create a storage account and a, and a resource group. So, you know, app, you know, we don't know what those are until Terraform actually runs. So in order to grab those values, we have to get them out of the state file. And that's what this step is doing. Next, we're going to grab a reference to the, um, the resources that the, that's created in the state file. We're going to get the, the storage account name and the resource group. And then we're going to actually get the real infrastructure that got created in Azure with get Azure, get AZ storage account and get AZ storage container. And after we've done all that, or after all the tests have ran, rather, we can destroy that infrastructure with Terraform destroy. And we can run, and before we actually do all, any of that, we run our tests. So here we're going to validate that our storage account is, is using the correct storage account naming structure that we have in the module. We're also going to actually test how does this storage account behave the way we think it should be. We said that the storage account should not have public uh, store, uh, containers. We can try to um, create a storage account, or sorry, um, we can try to create a storage container that's public, and that should throw an error. So we want to validate that with Pester. You know, if we try to run this, it's going to throw an error. We should also you know, validate that this container was actually created. And then we can also do some extra validation that, that once a storage account is created, you know, can we actually successfully upload a blob to it? So in this case, we're going to construct a blob of a certain size and try to upload it into the container. And this is just a little bit of logic to deal with the fact that premium storage accounts have to have um, files of a certain block size. So we're going to create a, a file that's exactly one megabyte. If the storage account is premium, then the blob type is blob, and we're going we're gonna to upload that blob as that blob type. So those are our tests. So let's go ahead and run this. Again, we can just run our, our pester test now. So we can do invoke pester. Let's get into the right directory first. We're going to run our unit test first. And show the detailed output. Again, this is only going to do the unit test because we put in a tag filter for just unit. So this will run initialize the Terraform validate, it'll run Terraform plan, and then it'll import that plan file, and then pass all of those settings in the pester into the it statements and actually run our unit tests. Again, this is not creating any infrastructure right now. This is just running the plan and then inspecting that to figure out what it would have done. All right, so that 
ran successfully and our all of our tests passed which is awesome so our test said it will create a storage account it would be in the correct location it will only allow https um, it will enable um, atp etc so that ran really quickly now let's try it and run our integration test which will actually again create real infrastructure invoke pester is going to loop over all of those test cases that we've defined and run. You know, we could have one or two or 10 different example directories of different scenarios that we want to test with this module. All of those will get executed by Pester, create brand new infrastructure dedicated for that test case, run Pester, and then destroy it. So this will take just a, a few seconds here to create this infrastructure. Okay, so it looks like this uh, completed, and you can see that it took 212 seconds to run everything. I've cut this out of the, of the video, so you didn't have to see me just staring and watching paint dry. But it looks like it did everything we needed. If we back up here to the very top, and we can see it's, um, it's running our integration tests, and it found all of our tests. We're going to run our, te our first test case, which is this one folder right here. It's going to run initialize, validate, and plan. It's going to show us exactly what it would have created. And then it's going to run apply, which is actually going to create the real infrastructure. So that runs for a little bit. Then we, you know, we import the state file that we just created. We get our references to the real infrastructure. And then we pass all that into our actual pester test cases where we can validate that, yes, the storage account was created. Public blob container is disallowed, you know, created a private storage container. We can upload a file into that private container. Again, you know, if we look back at our pester tests, you know, we tried to create private, uh, sorry, public containers, and those should have thrown exceptions. And pester validated that for us. And then it went on to the the other example case. Did the same thing. You know, validated that you know it can create it. It has a private storage uh, container. You know, we can't, up, you know, create public ones. We can upload a, a blob to it. And then it destroyed all the infrastructure. So, you know, that took considerably, considerably longer than the, than the unit test. But again, this is all getting created in a isolated environment. You know, isolated uh, Azure subscription dedicated for your tests. Okay, so in summary, I just want to reiterate that, you know, just like normal code, your infrastructure is code, be it your ARM templates, or your Terraform, your Pulumi, or whatever technology you use, should be tested just like regular code. It can have bugs, it will change over time. You just need to make sure that what you're actually writing actually behaves the way you expect it to, and the way we do that is through testing. You can use unit tests for fast validation to uh, validate the intended configuration without actually building any infrastructure. For more involved tests where you actually need to build something, you can run integration tests to deploy that infrastructure, run some type of more advanced validation, and then just destroy it when you're done. We can extend this practice even more by you know, wiring up this process into a CI CD pipeline. Imagine running Pester um, when you do a PR to a Git repository that has your Terraform module. You can run your unit and your integration tests on that PR and make sure that you know they have to pass before that PR can be merged. Then you can run it again on your on your main branch. After things get merged, you can run even more tests. You can use these tests to enforce policies or standards on your on your infrastructure code. So in, in the example, we had a storage account that we wanted to always make sure enabled HTTPS only and always disallowed public blob containers. We enforce those in Terraform, and we also double-checked that those were true in our pester tests. You can run them again on all PRs, and, and really the whole point of this is to catch errors before applying this infrastructure into your production environment. So we run these tests as we're developing our code, as we're changing it in, via PRs, so we can really have confidence that the infrastructure that we have behaves and is configured the way we, that we want it to. Thank you. That was the end of my presentation. Again, my name is Brandon Olin.
You can find me on the internet at devblackops on Twitter, on GitHub, or my blog at devblackops.io. And if you want to learn more about building PowerShell modules kind of in depth, you can check out my, my book that I'm currently writing on LeanPub. And with that, I want to say thank you and enjoy the rest of the summit.